Okay, good to see everybody. Uh, when I come in here for this, uh, it's always a reminder that there's no place like LSU to play college baseball, and uh, very grateful, you know, for the coverage and the exposure all of you, you know, give our players and our program. Uh, it's truly unique relative to our sport. Uh, we've had a great six and a half, seven months uh, since ending 2023. Uh, very proud of uh, the players in terms of what they've done and and put in. We have a lot of really good development stories that, you know, will come to light as we get into the 2024 season. Uh, really pleased with how they've operated both on and off the field. It's always a goal of ours to be a low drama program, and, and to this point we continue to be successful in that. Uh, another really good semester uh, in the classroom, second one, uh, where we've exceeded any, you know, team GPA for LSU baseball. And as I said, a lot of work on the field. Uh, again, for the third year in a row, we've had a ton of transition in terms of our coaching staff and couldn't be more convicted that uh, we definitely have the right guys in the building and the positive impact they're having you know, on our players you know, and have mixed well uh, with myself, Coach Jordan, Coach Wanaka, Jamie Tutko, but adding Coach Yeski on the pitching side of things. Uh, Coach McMillan on the strength and conditioning side of things, and Terry Rooney uh, has been a massive uh, lift for us and uh, really happy with how we're operating on a daily basis in terms of moving the way that we want to. Uh, logistically, how this will shake out is we'll have 18 practices over the next uh, 21 days uh, with three off days. Those will you know, largely depend on uh, weather. Uh, my hope is to scrimmage um, 11 or 12 times, you know, over those 18 days and um, get ourselves prepared for opening day. Uh, no different than, than usual. We treat the season like a 56 game playoff and it is in college baseball. And so the goal is to have our team as ready as we can, um, you know, for opening day. And then, you know, we're obviously going to need to improve and find out what our best team is as we go. But really exciting uh, time in terms of attacking uh, the challenges that 2024 presents. Hey, Coach, here in the back. Um, how do you raise the bar in 2024 after last year's season? Well, that's how I operate my entire life is, is always like what decisions can propel us in the program forward. And in terms of uh, results, you know, it's hard to do much better than, than that team did. I think uh, attacking different challenges and uh, what I would call our process of winning and constantly improving that. And, you know, college baseball and college athletics is kind of under construction, you know, as we know it. But if I look at how we operate, and this is always how I choose to do it, uh, at the highest possible level, what improvements can we make in doing that? I'll give you an example. You know, very thankful to our, our administration. You know, we were able to go get Jeremy McMillan, who I believe is the best strength coach in college baseball, and, and bring him in. And just in a month's time from the time we were done with them in the fall until they returned in January, players are stronger, they're moving better, more functional in baseball. So that would be an example of of trying to raise the bar. I think, um, you know, bringing in, you know, Terry Rooney, you know, along with Josh Jordan and myself, um, you know, try to recruit at the highest possible level and continue to add the talent needed to compete at the top of, of college baseball on an annual basis, which has been um, not easy to do, you know, in this, in this modern era. And I believe there's several reasons for that. But I think, you know, our MO as a program is always focusing on what's important right now and, and how we do what we do. We all know what we want to do, but how we get there is, is where we put all of our focus. Coach, I have two questions. What did you see in Gage Jump to want him to, come, to get him to come here and want him to come here? And then how has he come back from the injury? And then the second one is about Paxton Clay getting the chance to be able to play every day and it's it's his you know he's competing for a spot in center field how much more or less pressure does he have this year maybe than he had last year coming in as a freshman yeah in, in reference to gage 
I recruited him extremely hard at Arizona. It's one of those guys that when you're out there, like, we have to have this guy. And, and very rarely do you get this talent meets character, meets competitive, meets, you know, maybe he's a tick undersized, so we might be able to squeeze him through the Major League Baseball draft out of high school. And uh, we worked hard. You know, we, we didn't get him. Uh, he chose to go to, to UCLA. But in that process, I felt like we built a good rapport and, and relationship. And with that, uh, when he decided to go on the transfer portal, um, it wasn't that hard to reconnect. And then you're looking at uh, some of the stories of last year's team and what that team accomplished and what guys that maybe were in a similar situation a year ago, how coming to LSU elevated them and where they wanted to go. It was a attractive, you know, deal. But was the number one priority, you know what I mean, in terms of what we were going to do in the transfer portal. And maybe we're a little lucky that he was a little bit more under the radar because he missed last season. Um, but, you know, once I saw that, it was, let's, let's try to get this done. Now, returning from the injury, he missed the 2022 season. Uh, we've been very deliberate about that. I think he threw a total of, of six innings in the fall. And we built him up to, he threw one inning, one inning, and then two innings in the two outside scrimmages against McNeese and Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, he'll throw two innings, you know, today or this weekend, you know, and, um, you know, we'll build him, you know, accordingly, you know, for to be effective as he can be at the beginning and improve as the season goes along. But he's responded really well. In regards to Paxton, uh, massive, you know, uh, get for us to, you know, once he opened up his recruitment to get him back uh, to LSU. And, you know, it's it's easy to forget that, I mean, he was hitting leadoff opening day last year on that team. And so that says everything you need to know about what I believe, you know, Paxton's capability and and ceiling is. Uh, I have great faith in him. I think he's made some great strides in his development. He's one of those guys, as I said, you know, I'm excited for everyone to see the fruits of the labor of the work that they've put in, you know, in his case, both both physically and mentally and experience. You know, let's not forget he, he grew up in Pennsylvania, which, you know, because of weather, you know, you have to, you have to overcome that in terms of your baseball development. And, um, you know, he had, had a couple injuries last year, which, you know, didn't allow him to maybe stay in there, but um, was starting a game in the SEC tournament, had 100 at-bats, had a very successful 100 at-bats. You know, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find 10 more freshman players in the SEC that had as effective a season as Paxton. So uh, it's his time, and I'm super excited about that. And uh, love coached him. He's a great kid, great talent, and um, really happy for where he's headed. Hey, Coach, um, I have two questions. One, how has the team adjusted to the to now being the hunted of the Hunters from last year? And then Jake Brown was one of the top left-handed pitchers in the country out of the class of 2023. How has he looked in the outfield, and what does he need to keep improving on? Yeah, to your, your first question, I don't think a team – I don't think there's any transition in terms of how we're viewed. I don't, I've never seen a team with – more expectations on it than last year's team, and and it, to be clear, it's a clearly it's two different teams. Um, so in terms of the returning players, they they know exactly what's coming because it was coming in the same wave last year. I think you know our whole thought process behind that is uh, we're not defending anything. You know when you're being hunted, you're kind of on defense. We're not doing that. We're attacking 2024 and this opportunity, and uh, we've put a lot of time and and explaining to the team exactly what that looks like from a mindset uh, standpoint. And so feel really good about that. You know, in terms of Jake Brown, you know, obviously one of the best high school players in the country, uh, much like, you know, Paxton, we had to work hard to, to get him through the MLB draft, and we did. And um, love the fact that, you know, he's from Louisiana and how much he loves LSU and playing here meant something. It's always a good sign when your recruit goes and watches your team in the College World Series. And if you're sitting in that crowd, I mean, especially as an LSU person and seeing that in the, the opening game against Tennessee, like you're not going and playing minor league baseball in front of 12 dudes in Goodyear, Arizona. You're not. And, um, you know, I think he's really developed on the position player side of it. I'm not surprised at that. I saw him play in the spring last year. 
uh, when his team was over here playing locally and he's a great athlete and has the right kind of toughness and there's a lot of guys that fit into this category but he's what I want you know an LSU player or incoming player to be and really happy about Jake on both sides of the ball. Good year is lovely this time of year. It is this time of year for sure not in July. Um, everyone wants to know about your rotation and your your staff I guess so just get us caught up to speed on where you're at identifying you know the guys that you think you'll be useful early this season. Yeah, in terms of, of the pitching staff, uh, we like where we're at. Uh, it was a really deliberate effort, you know, really from the first day of being here to improve or upgrade the pitching talent. It's obviously the most important part of winning baseball. Winning starts and ends on the mound. So I think we did a great job over two and a half years or two years leading into this school year of assembling and collecting a lot of pitching talent. And I think last year's pitching staff was great. It was so deep that we were able to survive injuries and still win the national championship. I think we're in a really good spot. The next few weeks will determine a lot. Um, we're going to be super uh, deliberate in terms of building up pitch counts. There's certainly more than three guys that were extending their pitch counts. Uh, we have eight games in the first 10 days of the season, um, You know, trying to fit in the 56 and 14 weeks. And I'm excited about that because I think we're well positioned. You know, um, obviously at the end of the season last year, there wasn't four better pitchers in the country than Thatcher Hurd. You know, obviously from probably the time, um, you know, I had a great close game at Auburn, really kind of epic five inning performance at Georgia uh, to help us win that game in 12 innings, outstanding effort in the SEC tournament. Maybe the performance of the season here in the regional against Oregon State in the lightning delay game. We didn't actually have to use them in the super regional, but uh, held uh, the number one team in the country to one run over six innings in two appearances. And then obviously a phenomenal performance in the championship game. So uh, he's obviously, you know, in, in the top of that mix. Uh, we, we talked about Gage Jump, uh, he'll definitely be a part of that mix. Uh, adding Luke Holman from Alabama, you know, maybe as important as anything that we did to improve this team. I think he was one of the top pitchers in the league last year uh, that will be returning this year. Um, and so it's probably start there. I think um, there's another layer of the staff. Nate Ackenhausen is, you know, I trust Nate with my life. You know, I mean, he that performance against Tennessee was amazing. You know, he was kind of a go-to guy in all the key games, especially early in the season, and uh, feel comfortable with him really doing anything. And so you'll see him in that mix. Griffin Herring, uh, again, also, you know, Omaha hero, but also very, um, very important in terms of what we did last year. He got to the point early in the SEC schedule where we could bring him in in leverage situations and, and he came through and gave us some length while he was doing that. And so those are guys that, that I feel good about. And then there's there's a ton on the back end. And there's a ton, um, you know, Justin Lohr, uh, transfer from Xavier, will be a guy that you will go to a lot. I love everything about him. You know, I love the pitchability, the competitiveness, uh, the toughness, the focus. Uh, it's winning pitching, you know, in, in terms of Justin, Cameron Johnson, Obviously, well documented in terms of his talent, and uh, you know that that will speak for itself. I think with Cameron, the most important thing, or the most impressive thing to me, is he is more mature beyond his years relative to being ready for this, and he has a ton of confidence. He should have a ton of confidence, but he's controlling those things uh, really well. Uh, Gavin Gidry, you know, obviously, you know, was as important as anybody to our success. Some guys have elevated themselves from last year. Um, DJ Primo, Aiden Moffitt. I mean, both those guys essentially didn't pitch last year. Um, they'll be moving on to professional baseball after next year when it's their time. Like, that's how much talent they have. And really excited about uh, what they've done, you know, with Coach uh, Yeski. Christian Little, very good fall, very good fall. So really happy about, about that. And... Um, Kate Anderson, another freshman that uh, has got a chance to be a superstar. I would include him in that potential starting mix. I like the fact that we could be right-handed when we need to, left-handed when we need to, depth, uh, matchup. And so 
I think we're in a, a really good spot. Hey, Coach. Um, with Josh moving to second base, uh, what's the chemistry sort of look like between him and uh, Michael Braswell up the middle? Yeah, I, I love Josh Pearson. I think he's one of those guys that you can ask him to do anything and he's going to find a way within his talent or skill set to do it. You know, I think it's my job to always look at how do you raise the ceiling of your team, be thoughtful of that, and then give them a plan to to go work to execute that and then open up options and opportunities. You know, let's not forget we largely <laughs> won the national championship because the ball he caught again off Wyatt Lankford's bat in game one. If that gets over his head, we don't win the national championship. So he's an outstanding outfielder. He can go back to the outfield at any minute. Uh, he's a clutch hitter. And um, the efforts that he's made, you know, from the end of fall baseball till now, I mean, he looks like a, a second baseman. And I'm um, proud of him for that. I think Michael, as you, as you mentioned, Michael Braswell has done a great job of moving him forward a little bit. For a guy that hasn't played a lot of college infield with Josh, you know, watching them work together has been really good. And um, – really excited about that and uh, it gives us lineup flexibility obviously we could put him back in left or right field at any time um, the thought that we could play him at second base is good and uh, creates the depth kind of that that we need because you know if there's one area that depth's been you know something that we've had to pay attention to it's been with infielders and again being deliberate and who you go about getting in the portal you know like we did with Michael and, and Ben Napolt you know, having Josh in there gives us, in my opinion, five good options in the infield, and I feel a lot better about that now. Yeah, right over here. Uh, you mentioned you know, just kind of building off that question a little bit, just positional versatility with guys like Josh and then Jake Brown, Brady Neal, Hayden Travinsky, all seeing different positions. How deliberate was that as a, you know, position as a whole just to kind of get yeah. a number of guys action at different spots this offseason so they can provide you that versatility and what are the benefits you could see for that during the 2024 season? Well, the benefit was we knew we needed to improve the pitching staff and so we did that. And so when you're recruiting more pitching, investing in more pitching, you know, in terms of scholarships, you know, the number on that position player side goes down in terms of guys ready to step in and win an SEC game. So the fact that they can do multiple things really helps you know you mentioned the catchers with you know Brady I have no problem throwing Brady second base third base left field right field as, as just a ball player you know Hayden you know we'll see a lot of time with DH at bats there's no question about that I think he'll be one of the most dangerous hitters in college baseball this year and we're working hard to keep him healthy and in position to do that uh, Alex is probably exclusively a catcher um, Jake Brown can play all three outfield spots, can play first base, and um, it, it helps a lot, you know, especially with maybe the, the construction of this roster in terms of where we sit today. The fact that guys can move around is, is going to help us with depth, with help, with matchups, because it may not be quite the same in terms of bodies. I believe that it will be at some point, you know, whether that's this year or, or, or next year or what, because guys are really developing. In, in front of our eyes, and we've seen some of that since we've come back, but it really helps, you know, on, on this team. Hey, Coach. Uh, Christian Little, one of the guys that you talked about wanting to take that extra step uh, of development moving into the season. You said he had a great fall, but can you elaborate a little bit more on that development towards uh, the team this season? Yeah, I think it, it, one of my favorite things about coaching college baseball is that development happens at different times four guys and Christian you know decided to go to college a year early and that's a big jump I and mean, that's a big jump in the southeastern conference you know going from high school baseball in Missouri to the moon is, is the way I look at that and so um, you know there's some scars in that you know there's and that's how you get better though you know we have a saying with the players is you know not everybody likes to get messy but the messy is where the development happens and He's had success. We I mean, had some great outings. Closed out that win at Texas last year. Threw great against Kentucky here to start us off in that game. Got us out of a big jam somewhere else in SEC play. Finished the game at Texas A&M. So he was a contributor on the national championship team. But when you look at 
his ability to throw four pitches for strikes, uh, movement, velocity, makes the ball go down, can soften hitters up, we all believe in, in his ceiling. And so I think he put in a lot of work in the summertime on his own and then came back in a better place. And I think the working relationship with him and, and Coach Jeske has been really good. And uh, I'm excited to see that. And I'm looking forward to, you know, the, the maturity side of it, the mental side of it that will allow that talent to show up consistently because the talent is good enough to when it shows up consistently, you're talking about a high impact difference maker. Here, you mentioned the conviction of knowing that you have the right guys in the building on a staff wise. Are there specific examples that you could maybe elaborate on that you saw this fall where it's maybe yeah. some feedback from the players or the coaches yes. saying, hey, this is the right guys? Yeah, for sure. Happy to. Um, you know, and, and looking at, you know, the, the guys that were here last year, you know, I mean, Jamie Tutko as an example. I mean, there's one person that stands next to me in the dugout, and that's I trust Jamie with mm -hmm. my life. And the amount of work that he and I and the rest of our staff put in from a scouting standpoint to make sound in-game decisions super important. And, you know, he came to me in September and was like, you know, he felt like he's had a few, like, aha moments in terms of what we need to do with certain players, you know, and doing some additional research. So, you know, we just won 54 games in a national championship, and you got an important staff member going like, I'm trying to get better. So that's an example of that. Uh, with Coach Wanaka, you know, super important, you know, to me, the only coach that's been on, on my staff the whole time the effort he puts into positioning the defense, individual work with players, you know, us being in lockstep with uh, developing our position players. I mean, that's just continuing to, to grow. And um, really, I mentioned the work that some of these guys have put in. They look different now than they did in November. You know, I mean, physically standing in the box, maturity-wise, all those types of things. Josh Jordan, uh, we had another good, you know, recruiting cycle for – pushing it forward and uh, I mean you, you can't work any harder than than Josh and then Terry has added that same element I mean this is all I do I mean, this is all I do and those guys are here before me and they leave after me which is nearly impossible and um, so that makes you feel good and then to your point player feedback and pitcher feedback on Coach Jeske has been phenomenal and that's why I brought him here I brought him here to know exactly what I was getting out of a pitching coach and we haven't even seen the best of it yet because the games haven't started where that's where I think he really adds a tremendous amount of value but you know talking about Christian Little uh, the improvement there DJ Primo you know we had him and, and Coach Jeske working one-on-one -on -one in the mornings all fall and uh, that worked really really well and you're taking a guy that redshirted couldn't even put him on a mound and you'll be in the game at important times and so um, in its totality, Coach McMillan, you know, on the strength side of it, Isaac Trujillo in the training room, and um, it feel, feel real good about it. Coach, um, what did last year teach your returning players, and what can it teach your new players that even in a national championship season, there will be losses, there will be struggles, there will be times where some fans will say this team's not going anywhere and to block out the outside noise and, you know, maintain the course? You know, I think valuing the work you put in every day and when you know that you've put maximum effort towards preparation and readiness to execute your job to help the team win, that you can play with a bunch of peace of mind. And I think that's what we did. I mean, to be number one for 12 or 13 weeks in a row, that's amazing in, in the SEC. And, you know, I think this year's no different. I saw something like there's nine ranked teams, seven teams in the top ten. Like, nobody does what we do. Like, nobody plays the schedule that we play. And so um, understanding that if they put the hay in the barn, they stay connected to the path that we need to do to win, that you will get results. They also, I think, learned, you know, even though, in my opinion, it was really minimal, but, you know, failure is not fatal unless you allow it to be from a mindset standpoint. And, you know, I think we exhibited that really well. You know, home series loss here late. You know, even though we won like seven SEC series in a row, uh, lost two in the SEC tournament, which is basically because of me. 
I mean, the decisions that I made to pull pitchers out of the game and not play certain players. Um, but they responded from that, played our best baseball of the year in the postseason last year. The Yankees were not beating us in the regional or super regional last year. Um, and then in Omaha, I mean, you lose game two, which we played good. We lost to one of the best pitchers in the country in a great game that they got a two-out hit in the eighth inning, and we didn't. And so, you know, bouncing back from that to win three in a row, and then, you know, the 24-4 game. So I just think they're well positioned to understand what this is really about. And so if they keep their eye on the ball, no pun intended, that, you know, you can, you can get through things. And we're going to have to do that because the only thing I can ever guarantee them in a college baseball season is adversity. And so we're going to need to utilize that experience for our benefit for 2024. Yeah, Jay, what were your conversations with Travinsky like to get him to come back? And what's his greatest value to this team? Why you wanted him back? Yeah, and I, I did work hard on that. You know, there, there was guys on last year's team where it was their time to go. Even if it was a little bit in the middle, it was definitely their time to go for their best interests. And I always try to find a situation where the player wins and the, and the program wins. And with Hayden, you know, at least since I've been here, he hasn't had a stretch where he's been healthy. And so I still believed there was more on the table for him at LSU. And he believed the same. And it is really cool to see that type of maturity because he definitely could have been drafted and signed. I mean, he, that was all him to decide that he wanted to do this. And so in terms of value, I already said I think he will be one of the most dangerous hitters in college baseball this year. I mean, I really – and I think he's gotten better. I thought he got better last year. And throughout this fall, uh, the maturity in the at-bats is what you'd expect of a guy with that talent, with this experience to have. Now it's our job to keep him healthy, keep him on track. And, and really pleased with Hayden, Alex, Tommy, Thatcher, Josh Pearson, Will Helmers. Those guys saw the value of great player leadership last year and maybe one of those lessons – that was Jock that Jock was referring to, and they're paying that forward in a big way, and he's he's right at the center of that. Hey, Coach um, Brady Neal obviously contributed in a really really big way last season um, for the better part of the season um, before his injury. After that injury, how did he kind of shift in ways that he can still contribute, but obviously in a much different way? What did those roles look like? What was his attitude towards those roles? Yeah, Brady again, like Christian, he skipped his senior year of high school, and probably lucky for us because he probably wouldn't be here had he not done that, and. He was a huge part of our team. We were never not the number one team in college baseball with him as the everyday catcher. And that was a blow it, at the time. And luckily, we were well positioned with Alex and Hayden to overcome that. And I remember it was pretty clear he was going to be out for a while when he got hurt. And, you know, I grabbed him the very first game. He wasn't playing. And, and I, was, I just pointed at Cade Beloso and I said, hey, I want you to watch every single at bat that Cade Beloso takes the rest of the season. Because if you can do this, along with all the other things that you do well, you're going to leave here a very happy player. And there's going to be a pro team that's going to be really happy to draft you really high someday. And, you know, it's a, it was a tricky injury. So it wasn't like, hey, just rehab and get better. Like it needed the time that we gave it. And he's in a good spot now. And I think he grew a ton. And that's part of why guys need to come here. And, and it's just we want it to be all sunshine and rainbows, you know, Dylan Cruz from the first A-B of his life till, you know, singling the center field in his last. And it just doesn't happen like that. And so I'm proud of him. I'm proud of his growth and development. And just the conversations he and I have now on a daily basis are much more advanced than they were a year ago. And um, – you know, he's going to be a huge part of, of this team, you know, this year and next year. Trey was so good for you at first last year. How are you positioned to, to field that position now? Yeah, Jared is going to probably be the first baseman as of today. You know, much like Paxton, that's a guy I want to get behind and go. And as long as the mindset is right, then I feel good about that. He's a huge target. I thought he was so good – or maybe a little more advanced than we thought, that it allowed us to 
past the time where Trey was hurt and couldn't catch the ball at first base from a throw across the infield that we could leave him in the outfield and and Jared you know I mean three over 300 hit 14 homers in the SEC as a freshman that's great production and um, he's super competitive he's obviously super talented you know we've survived two years of coach Kelly not trying to drag him over there and play D-line um, so that's a good thing um, and you know I I texted, you know, somebody around him and just like, hey, make sure he's continuing to get his work in over break defensively because defense at first base, as we saw, is one of the most undervalued things in, in baseball. But I like where he's at right now. It's just kind of my follow-up. It's, it's different athletically, right? But it doesn't mean it can't be successful. Yeah, for sure. And, and again, the player you're talking about, um, pretty special. Like, I mean – Sometimes he would just fall on the ball, and I'd have no idea how he caught it. Like, I mean, special hand-eye coordination, confidence, all those types of things. But we had a little joke, he and Jared and I, going through this year. It's like, and it's already broken, like, hey, I never want to hear how good a first baseman Trey Morgan is again because they already forgot because you're just doing your job. You don't have to be spectacular gold glove like that, but that you're just doing your job. And, and I think he's even doing a little more than that right now, so I'm excited about that. You mentioned Kate Anderson earlier. Just what have you seen from him since he stepped on campus, and how big of a role can he have this year? Yeah, um, really pleased. I think had he not had the injury in high school, he may have been difficult to get to college. You know, and it's, it's one of those things that maybe we got lucky. I think the uh, poise, far beyond the years, the athleticism, the confidence, so those mental game pieces where players – have to develop the most probably he checks a lot of those boxes and then you talk about explosive life on the fastball the breaking ball going down soften up with change up it's pretty good he's really good and uh you know same kind of thing we're trying to bring him along back from the injury in a intentional way in a smart way because you know that's a that's a huge piece of lsu baseball moving forward you know like cam and like Jake Brown and like Stephen Milam, Ashton Larson. So, um, I think you said you were recruiting while you were in Omaha, right? You were, yes. I have no recruit. I was wondering how how long you how long did you allow yourself to celebrate the championship? <laughs> and uh, the obviously everyone talks about you win a championship. It's easy to want to take a breath and and enjoy it a little bit. But how have you tried to? have the mindset of, as you said, attacking, yeah. and how, how are you trying to translate that to the team? Okay, that was a lot, Scott. Um, that's okay. No, it's all, all good. Um, definitely work needed to be done in Omaha, and I'm very proud of what we accomplished while we were there. You know, we got Michael Braswell, we got Justin Lohr, and we got Kate Woods all while we were in Omaha, and we were setting the table for Luke Holman, Gage Jump, and Mac Bingham. And so I feel like we, we executed that. Uh, really well as far as time off and enjoying um, this is interesting I tried not to go to bed on on the Monday night after we won I made it till about 4 or 40 um, and then the next day we flew home and that was great the flight and got back and then you know it was just like hey there's a few things like I need to need to do like the it, nobody was worried about us getting our appropriate time to celebrate. So I remember doing some things the next day. Celebration was phenomenal. But then Thursday and Friday, we had individual meetings with the team and, you know, got on a plane Saturday morning. And uh, it was fun seeing a few of our supporters at the BTR airport going like, what are you doing? It's like, trying to do it again. <laughs> um, and went out and saw Luke Holman, you know, that day. And so... Um, that was kind of the timeline on that. I think as far as your question, which that's where my focus is at, is, you know, honoring the process of how we roll, you know, for lack of a better way to say it. And I'm really pleased with the players right now. There is a just a attitude about we need to go about this a certain way, you know, to, to try to keep our seat at the table you know, or, 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 you know, make our seat at the table. Because we have a great schedule. We have great challenges. It's a, another up year for the SEC. Everybody's getting twice as many players as we are in, in, in the portal, you know. And so there's some challenges. But how they're going about attacking those challenges has been really positive. 
um, you know, there's no complacency, and uh, just this thought that there's a uh, there's a need to to accomplish something for for them. You know, last year it was you know we need to get back, want to get back to the top. You know, again one step at a time, but hadn't been program hadn't been to Omaha in six years. And then now it's it's about them creating their own legacy. Not easy to do. This is the best program in college baseball. It was only one one time in the 2000s and been to Omaha back to back. So that tells you how hard it is. And so if it's that hard to have any chance to create their own legacy, it's going to require their undivided attention. And so we've celebrated appropriately and when the season's over, you know, and people want to still celebrate 2023, it's, it's great. But for now, like, it, this just requires our full attention. And that's how we try to do it all the time. So I don't think it's it's that big a shift. Uh, Zeb Ruddle obviously was the guy who redshirted last season. What has he sort of done, uh, I guess, over the last, you know, eight, nine months to sort of prove that he could be a guy who could help you guys out this season? Yeah, Zeb had a good – or used his time well last year while he was redshirting. He added some strength. He went out to summer ball, had a really good summer. Cal Ripken League uh, for the Bethesda big train. Uh, had a good fall, uh, played well in the outside games. And, you know, I, I love his work ethic. I love his toughness. Again, he is an exact type of person that we need and want in the program understood you know the situation last year and it's a competitive situation again this year but um there's at bats for him to get and uh he's one of those guys that early returns in terms of how he looks today is better than how he looked in the fall and i wouldn't expect anything less because of the work ethic and the character of the person and we're trying to give him a really specific template as we do all the players of where we need them to get to to make the best impact on the team I think he's definitely doing that. Hey, Coach, back in the back again. Um, back to Tuco. You mentioned him earlier. Tuco, oh, excuse me. Um, I'm sure you – I'm assuming you know about the situation with the gentleman helping his mom in the airport and he was yeah. on LSU tickets. Yeah. What does that say about his uh, his character? Yeah, he's a 10. Yeah, that's uh, one of the most important people in my life. There's, like, probably five of them. Jamie's on that list, you know. Um, but that's classic him and – uh, not as I mean, it, everybody's like, "Whoa, what a cool story!" And this and that. That's I see it every day. So it's it is a cool story. But I'm like, I'm not surprised just because that's how that's how he is. Hey, coach, in the back here. Uh, what are some of the unique things that Tommy brings to this team, and what are you hoping that he could add to his game this season? Yeah, what is wrong with you people? It took us like well, however many minutes to get to the best hitter in college baseball. Uh, good job. Um, He's special, dude. I mean, just the competitive nature is second to none. When he steps in the batter's box, um, it's something else. And um, obviously we saw that to the tune of whatever it was, 105 RBIs. And it wasn't just 105 RBIs. It was always when we needed it. You know what I mean? And um, just the, uh, the, the drive to be as good as he possibly can be, the intent behind that, and it served him well. I mean, uh, surgery right after Omaha on his shoulder, missed the entire fall, but kept his body in a great spot, took an exceptional step in leadership, you know, during that time, and super proud of, of Tommy for that, and then, you know, has rehabbed in a way where he's ready to go, and um, that you, you wouldn't know that he didn't, taking a bat for six months, uh, the way he looks right now. And so I'm proud of him for that. So uh, just complete is, again, the word that, that I would use. And i um, super excited about him being here this year again. Coach, the role that you see for Gavin, do you see any time middle infield kind of thing? Or is it Gavin Gidry, the pitcher? And what have you seen in terms of the development of Gavin this year and through the fall on the mound? Yeah, he is going to mainly focus on pitching. Um, with that being said, he's such a good athlete that when you trickle down the roster for SEC play, I have no problem putting him in to play defense, run, step up to the bat, execute something. 
but we're going to put the focus on pitching um, because we, I don't want to say we didn't throw him into pitching. We built him up to pitch last year, but he didn't pitch in the fall last year. And the load that he took on throughout the season, uh, we did not have him pitch in the fall. We went back to the position player thing and so kind of slowly built him up again. But I'm really excited for him to be able to dive in on this and this alone and see where we can get his ceiling. And, and as a competitor, he's going in the game. I mean, that's just how I, I feel. Like when he's on the mound, I feel like you're going to win. You know, and there's a lot of guys on this staff that I feel that way about. Um, so I think there's some untapped potential by focusing on that. But we're not abandoning the, the potential to contribute on the two-way thing. We're just going to put more focus on the pitching for his benefit. Uh, what were your first thoughts when you heard Michael Broswell was going to be leaving South Carolina? And uh, how important is it that he came to LSU? Yeah. Um, so my first thoughts was he went in the transfer portal, and I yelled at Josh, like, get me his number, like, yesterday. And so he did, and we called him, and he's like, um, hey, coach, we had just beaten Kentucky in the Super Regional. And if you remember, the game two, that was a game, like, Jordan made, like, three ridiculous plays like ridiculous, like Major League Baseball caliber plays. And I remember being happy we're going to Omaha, but the way my brain works, like, man, it's going to be hard to replace, <laughs> you know, that kind of – that caliber of defense. And so I was talking to Michael. He was excited to hear from us. He's like, yeah, I'll come down when you guys get back from Omaha. And I was like, no, why don't you come tomorrow? And um, so he flew in the next day, and we had a good couple days, and I think, you know, the day before the first game in Omaha, he called and said he was going to come to LSU, and he means a lot to our team. And, and this is with great respect for other players. It's it's kind of hard to imagine our team this year without him. And um, he's done a great job defensively. He's better than I thought, and I always had a high opinion of him. Like we brought him here because I liked him. You know, whenever we were scouting another opponent that South Carolina was playing. Myself and Coach Wanaka were like, man, this this would be a great guy to have, just casually saying it. And then when we played them last year, both in Columbia and in the SEC tournament, like I thought he took very mature at bats. And I just like how he plays. Like it's just like it's it's this guy that's going to make everybody else around him better. And that's absolutely the way that it's it's happened. And so when he went in the portal, it was like, no, nah, man, you need to show up and. Um, so he was here the one day between us, you know, winning the Super Regional and leaving for Omaha, and thankfully he chose to come here. And it's one of those deals that's mutually beneficial. Him and Coach Wanaka have put in a lot of work on the offensive side of it, and I think he led our team in hitting in the fall. And he's off to – has a really good idea of what he's doing right now. Just about time to wrap up with Coach Johnson. Anyone else have a question for Coach? One, one more for Michael. I can't get Dan to get on a mic, so uh, can you give us any facility updates, any wish list things that obviously won't be time for this season, but something you're looking forward towards in the future? Yeah, I think, you know, it's two things, you know, in terms of stadium upgrades. You have the player development, which that's always number one for me, and then you have the fan amenities. The fan amenities, I'm going to leave to them, you know, and I want to make sure that our fans are taken care of and, you know, our administration is well positioned to do that better. You know, I, we want to just expand our hitting facility with an indoor infield and uh, make it awesome. And I mentioned that several players have put themselves in a better position for this year because of the work that they've put in. We, we've built a culture of where they show up and they work on their own, and I want them to have an awesome place to do that and to, you know, push ourselves forward. That's that's the next thing that, that we need to do. And so. There's a lot of planning, you know, going on with that, and you know we want to we want to make that happen, you know, sooner rather than later, obviously. All right, thank you, All right. Thank you guys.